Hey guys, and welcome to my video on how to use my Navigation 3D plugin. Uh, so basically the way this video is going to be structured is I'm going to first show you a quick little example of what it looks like when you use it. And then after that we'll be going into a little bit more detail on how the actual plugin works. So we'll go through all the functions and what they do, and all the different objects and what they do. It's really not that much stuff. It's pretty, pretty simple, but I just wanted to kind of go through it. Um, so once you guys know how to use the plugin, the last thing I'll do at the end of this video, just in case anybody needs help, is I'll show you guys how to download the plugin and how to set it up for your project. Um, so just right up front, if you look at the links in the description of this video, there'll be a link to my to the GitHub page where you can go and download this. So if you already know how to download plugins and add them to your project, then by all means, you can skip the last part of this video and just do that right now if you want to even. Um, but if you're going to need help with setting that up, just watch to the end of the video and I'll go through it. All right, so the way the plugin um, works so let's just go ahead and run this uh, but I will, before i run it basically what it's going to do is this little cube over here is going to fly through this maze following the best path that it can to get to this um, cube over here so it's going to go up down left right you know wherever it needs to go to get to that cube without hit, hitting any of the walls so i go ahead and i play this and then i step out oh wait i forgot to change hold on let me just just pretend like you're not looking at this right now um, because I was recording earlier and I messed something up. Okay, so pretend like you didn't see that. I'll explain that later. So if I play it, you can see it goes around and it follows the best path that it can to get to the end. And it's kind of being drawn by these little red uh, diamond things or whatever they are. So that's that's the way the plugin works. And as you can see, it's not just going left and right. It's also it goes up and down if it needs to. So you can see when it gets here, it goes you know up over this wall and it goes down under this one. Um, so yeah, it's truly a 3D pathfinding um, algorithm that it's using. So to show you how it works, the main uh, meat to the plugin is the navigation volume 3D. So if you come up here to place actors at the top left and you search for navigation, uh, navigation volume 3D, you can actually just drag this into the scene um, like so. And you can see it's basically a grid, and it's the same thing that I have down here. So I'm just going to delete this one. But that's how you would add it to your scene. You just drag it in like so. And so that's what this uh, this black uh, grid is. And so to select it, you just come up here to the world outliner, and you search for your navigation volume, and you select it. And that will select the grid. And then there's some properties on it that I want to talk about real quick, um, just so you guys are familiar with how to use it and what you can change about it. So if you select it and you go to the details panel and then you scroll down to the navigation volume 3D section, uh, there's two subsections in here. So we have aesthetics and pathfinding. Aesthetics is things that obviously are just purely aesthetics. So they don't actually affect the game. They don't affect the algorithm. They're just about how the grid looks. Um, so you can see you can change the line thickness. So I'll set it to like 10 and you can see it makes the lines of the grid much thicker. And you can also change the color of the lines. So you can set it to like blue or something and it will change it to a blue color. And then one thing that's also worth noting here, if you search for hidden in game, you can set this to true or false, depending on if you want the um, grid to be shown in game or not. So if you set it to true, which it's, I think it's set to true by default, and then you play it, you'll see everything will still work just fine, but you won't be able to actually see the grid. Um, and then obviously if you set it to false, like I had it before and you play it, then you can actually see the grid while the game's playing. Uh, and there's basically, there's there's honestly really hardly any performance impact to drawing this grid, even if it's quite large. So um, I wouldn't worry about performance in terms of rendering the grid. So if you need the grid to be rendered, just set hidden in game to false. And if you don't, then set it to true. Um, but I'm going to set it back to false for now. And then we'll go and continue talking about the other properties. So the other ones are obviously... Uh, things that actually affect the pathfinding. So for pathfinding, we have the divisions X, Y, and Z. And so this obviously changes how many divisions there are to the grid. So I can set this like 100, and it'll add a bunch more on that side. And this one changes the Y. And you'll notice um, once you start, so if I set to this like 50 here, and I press enter, once you start getting to a large number, it actually takes it a second to fully um, like update the grid because it gets so large and the reason it's doing that is mostly because it's doing a bunch of pre-optimizations for you and it's also just a lot of looping in the background 
Um, but once it's created, it's it's good to go. Now, when you press play, you're also going to get, if the grid is massive like it is right now, you're going to get a small delay. So I hit play. I'm going to get a small delay. So you can see there's a small delay when it started. And the delay will get bigger depending on, you know, how big your grid is. But you'll notice once the game's running, it's it's good to go. You're not getting any hiccups or it's not laggy. Um, the grid is very optimized. It's just because it does a lot of the optimization at the beginning and begin play as opposed to when the game's running. So just something to keep in mind, you, you also noticed um, the algorithm was like, oh, okay, I can go up now. Let me just go over all these walls. Um, so you can see it's a truly a dynamic algorithm. It, it's really going to find the best way to get to the path based on the grid. Uh, so let me set the grid back to how it was. Uh, so it's like this guy. I think I had it 38 by 38 by, oops, not one. 38 by 10. Uh, and then the division size is how big an individual um, cube is. So if I change this from 50 to 100, you'll see it cuts it down by a half and on each axis. So now it's a lot smaller. Let me change the size of these back to like two. So now the boxes are a lot smaller. Um, so obviously you want to set the division size based off of how accurate you need the collision to be, because basically the way the algorithm works is that if a cube inside of the grid is overlapping with something, it's going to it's gonna consider the whole cube to be off limits in terms of pathfinding. So if you have massive, so if I set this like 500, well these, these cubes might be a little bit too inaccurate because it's going to consider like this whole chunk of area to be off limits just because it's colliding with this wall. And same with like, you know, this top portion here. It's going to say this whole thing is off limits, I think, because it's overlapping down here. So you want to set this based off your game. You know, if you're making like a space game with a bunch of open space and it's really big, then you would probably want to set the division size to be pretty large because um, obviously the larger it is, the more area you can cover in a more optimal, optimized way. Um, but the less accurate the actual pathfinding is going to be. But again, if you're just in space for the most part, and there's maybe there's some asteroids and stuff floating around, then by all means, set this to a really large number. But if you're in like an enclosed room and you have like a drone that's following you around, then you're going to need to set this to be a lot smaller. So I'm going to set it back to 100 for now. Um, and then this last one's kind of hard to explain exactly what it does. It's easier just to show you. And then, so I'll just do that real quick. So you can see if I run this now, um, I just want to, Oh, let me turn back on the grid because it's going to be easier to visualize if we can actually see the grid like so. So this is what it's set to zero. And it's basically saying, it basically defines um, what nodes are allowed to be neighbor nodes. And when it's set to zero, it basically means that any node that's touching it, whether it's like touching it on the side or at an angle, is is okay. So that means that if you think of it like a Rubik's cube and, and you're currently in the middle of the Rubik's cube, it's saying that you can go to any of the other nodes on the Rubik's cube, like any of the other cubes on the Rubik's cube, because it will go in any direction. It, there's no limit to it as long as it's touching it to some degree. Um, that, and the zero basically means that it requires that you only share zero axes with the neighbor to count it as a neighbor. And so that, of course, means that it can go in any direction. Um, but if we set it to something else, so if we set it to one, that means it has to at least share one axis with the neighbor for it to be considered a neighbor. So again, if you think of the Rubik's Cube example, and you're inside the Rubik's Cube, and you want to figure out which ones are neighbors, well, most of them would be neighbors, but not the ones at the very corners of the Rubik's Cube, because those don't share any axes. Like, no, it doesn't share the X, the Y, or the Z axis with the, um, with the center cube. So if I run this now, you'll see it will still go at diagonals, like it still goes diagonally right here, but it's not going, it's only going diagonal in one direction. It's only going diagonal, um, like it's not going also up. So it couldn't go up here to this one, for example, because that's not sharing any axes with it. And if you bump it all the way up to two, which is the max, then it's saying you have to share at least two axes with it. So now you can see it doesn't ever go on any diagonal at all. So again, if you think of a Rubik's cube and you're in the middle of it, then you could only go left uh, right, up, down, forward, or back. You couldn't do any type of diagonal movement at all. So you can just set this based on how you want your movement to behave. I just kind of included it as a nice little feature. Um, so that's what that is. Um, the next thing I wanted to point out, so w once the plugin's added to your project, you'll have this folder over here. You might need to go to view options and turn on um, 
show plugin content to be able to see this. But once you have show plugin content on, you'll have the navigation 3D content and then get navigation C++ classes. So the C++ classes, the only thing inside of here is the navigation volume, which is the guy that we already haven't seen. We already talked about him. Um, but if you go to the content, I've just added, well, so this grid material, you need this and it needs to stay here because it's the, it's the material that the grid uses. So just don't touch that. Um, and the flying pawn example, this is just an example pawn that I've created to show you guys how you could go about using this. And so that's what this little um, ball thing down here is. Um, so you, so when you go to write your game, you can kind of look at this as an example, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, it's a default pawn. And so it has a movement component to it. And basically what it does is it gets the navigation volume and then it kind of saves it and then it makes sure that it's valid and then it calls this find navigation volume three or sorry find path off of the navigation volume 3d so this is the main function here that you're going to be using uh, so what this does is it takes in a start and a destination and then it takes in object types and actor class filters so what this is um, these two are used for collision so it's basically saying um, any actor in the scene that is of one of these uh, object types will be considered collidable. So if you want the pathfinding to, you know, collide with uh, projectiles, for example, you'd select projectiles. You want it to collide with vehicles, you'd select vehicles. So this allows you to configure exactly what it's going to consider as like a navigationable tile versus a non-navigationable tile. Let me just remove that. And then the actor class filter, you pretty much just want to always set this to actor. It's um, it's just using the collision code as like the base class. I don't, I don't actually remember. It's the same thing for when you do like line trace by channel. I think oh, it's going to make me that. Or it's, um, what is it called? Ox overlap actors. Yeah. So it's the same. You can see it's similar to these parameters here. This is just an Unreal Engine function. But it's the, it basically filters out and says anything that's not of this class, we will not collide with. So if you set it to actor, since that's the base class of everything, then it won't filter anything. But anyway, so this finds you the best possible path. Um, if it can't find the path, it's going to return false. Um, but if it does find the path, it's going to return true, and it's going to turn you an array of vector 3Ds, which are going to be positions. So all the positions. And you can see all I'm doing here is I'm just looping over them and drawing that little red debug sphere. So that's why you see these little red debug spheres, just because I'm drawing them. And then this is just some really quick example code I wrote for how you might, you know, fly between paths if you want to. So it just waits a second and then it loops over or it grabs the next index in our path, which starts at zero. And then it just says move to location and it gets the next location and it moves there. And then when it finishes, it increments the path index. So it goes to the next node and then it just loops back and it does that again. So you can look this code in more detail, but it's, again, it's just an example of how you might use it. The main, the main important function here is this one, but again, it's pretty straightforward how to use. Um, and then over here on the left, I have some, I have some functions that are also worth noting, because, depending on what you're doing. So these are all other functions that I've written. Um, this one is really helpful. Again, you have to call it off the navigation volume 3D, but it converts a coordinate to a location. So a coordinate, if you split this, you can see it's just an X, Y, and a Z, an X, Y, and a Z. So for some reason in your game, you need to figure out the world location of a specific coordinate on your grid. You can do that. And then this is basically just the opposite. It takes in a location in world space and it converts it to a location on the grid. So if you wanted to be able to like, you know, fly to where the player is, you could pass in the player's location here. And then this would return you the exact grid coordinate. And then, well, I mean, you'd really just call find, find path and it would do it for you. But if you wanted to know which grid coordinate he's in for some reason, you could use this as well. Um, and then these are just accessors for the different settings on the grid, like the size and the divisions and all that stuff. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. So at this point, I'm going to go over and show you guys how to set up the plugin with your project. Um, so to do that, Again, there's a link in the description of the video, but it will link you to this page, which is the GitHub repository for it. And what you're going to want to do is just, let me make sure I don't already have it downloaded. Okay, I don't. So you just want to come over here and select this green button and say download zip file. You can also clone it if you want to, um, but I know a lot of people don't use Git. 
So you can just go ahead and download it as a zip file, and then it will start downloading. And then while that's downloading, it should only take a second. Um, I'm just going to make a new project to show you how you guys or how you would do this from scratch. So I'm on 4.25.3. Um, you're going to have to be on this one or a newer one for it to work because the plugin's made in 4.25. So if you're on an older version, you're going to need to update. And then we want to select games, and I'm just going to do first person. And hit next, and then blueprints, no starter content, and I'll just call this. Um, Flying AI tutorial, and then go ahead and create the project. And then this is going to go ahead and create for us. And then once it finished creating, we're actually going to want to close it so that we can add the plugin to it. So let's just go ahead and close this. And then go to your downloads folder. And we want to take this guy, so the thing that we just downloaded, and then go to the project that you just created. So mine get created to Unreal Projects and then Flying AI Tutorial. And then you can just paste it in here for right now and then just right click and unzip it with whatever unzipping tool you use. And that will unzip it. And then we wanna take, we wanna go inside of here and take the plugins folder and cut it and put it in the root directory. And then we can delete these two guys. So. At the end, you should just have the plugins folder, which should have a Navigations 3D inside of it, which has all the code that you need. And then now we can come back here and launch this project again. And it might tell you that it's built with a different engine version. That's okay, just hit yes. If you have troubles getting it working, um, I have a Discord link in the description as well. You can come in and ask for help because sometimes it can be a little finicky or you might need to update your uh, Visual Studio SDK to like the latest one. But hopefully, it will just update it like it's doing right now, and then it will launch here in a second. And we will wait. Shouldn't take that long. All right, there we go. So now it's updated and it's launching. It's going to have our plugin included with it. So we've launched. Um, and again, you might need to go to View Options and turn on um, Show Plugin Content if you can't see these things over here on the left. So I'm going to hit this little arrow and then. We have our content and our C++ classes, just like we did before. So we can come up here and we can search for our navigation 3D volume. I'm just going to set this up real quick just to show you that it works. And then the details, let's change it to like, um, let's change it to like 100 by 100. And then I'll just move it over here. And then I'll drag in my little example guy. So my content folder, we'll drag in this guy, put him right here. And then he has this little destination thing. So you can click on this destination and then you can move it separately. So we'll just move this guy somewhere over here, like so. And then if I press play, you can see it draws the little red lines to where I put the destination and then he flies right there. So yeah, that's basically the end of the tutorial. Um, if you guys enjoyed the plugin or enjoyed the tutorial, I would really appreciate a like and subscribe. I also have a Discord channel if you're interested in joining that or if you have questions. There's also a link to my Patreon in the description of this video. If you guys want to support me, that's always greatly appreciated. Um, yeah, otherwise, I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks.